Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. Today we're going to be joined by two startups as part of the Aurora Space Hub. Uh, Phil Ridley, CEO of Quasar Satellite Technologies and Shankar Siravprakasam, co-founder with Antares. They have both si signed a uh, new partnership as par part of the Antares uh, sort of Space Hub uh, marketplace. And without further ado, we're going to look at the Space Startups Team Up Phased Array integration with Open Satellite Platform. Without further ado, Phil Ridley and Shankar. Gents, thanks for joining. Pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Good Great. To be here. Okay, we've got audio. Um, we might start with uh, you, Shankar, in terms of Antares, because I think that'll then sort of introduce Phil uh, and Quasar as a ground station. But yeah, to introduce us to yourself and Antares, uh, and then we'll move into uh, what you are doing. Very interesting marketplace in terms of a SaaS platform for satellites. That's right. Thank you for that great introduction, Chris. I couldn't have done any better. <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday morning for the audience, but anyway, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, yes, yeah, so as, you, as you mentioned, I'm Shankar, and I'm one of the co-founders of Antares. Um, so we are founded in the US with a couple of other of my co-founders. All of us met at Planet, Planet Labs, uh, the one of the poster child of new space way back in the 2010s. And uh, I live in Sydney, Australia. So, you know, while as we co-founded in the US, we opened um, our offices in Sydney, Australia, in Singapore, and also in India. Um, nice. so, so that's how we are set up. And as to who we are, we are, as, as, the, as the background on, on, on the screen shows, we are software for satellite. So what does that mean? We, we provide uh, software for you, a mission owner, a satellite operator to design, build, operate, and more importantly, decommission. We want we don't yeah. want people flying satellites to leave debris up there. Decommission all of that uh, from a SaaS platform, a software as a service platform. And that software as a service platform is supported by a trusted marketplace. A yeah. trusted marketplace is is uh, hosting a number of uh, participants. Uh, every everybody from you know bill of material suppliers like your reaction wheels to solar panels to power systems to ground station operators such as uh, Quasasat and Phil right and we'll talk about what's so unique about that and also other service providers you know could be integrators AIT providers etc cetera, etc cetera. why this it is meant to reduce or remove friction in the whole satellite value chain so while as we have a SaaS platform a low cost development platform for mission owners to design, build, operate, manage the satellite, we're also making that supply chain friction, removing the supply chain friction by providing that trusted marketplace. So pretty much drag and drop from all the qualified suppliers. So you can get on with flying your mission faster, better, cheaper. Now you're, you're coming up to about a year uh, old. One thing I would like to, even from the start there is you're setting yourself up as a global business, right? Singapore, India, US and Australia. Uh, you're touching Europe at all, and and where kind of what's your the business plan here? Do you, do you see yourselves putting Australia on the map and and using the Australian partnerships and taking them to the world? Is that kind of the the key scope here? Absolutely, it's two sided, Chris. Great yeah. question. So we want to bring our partners from outside Australia into Australia, but we also want to export our partnerships from Australia to rest of the world. So, for example, you mentioned in our previous conversation, I mean prior to this, uh, the interview that you talked with uh, Tony at AI Craft as an example. Yeah. So by space qualifying Tony's AI Craft H module on our demonstrator flight, now we are opening an opportunity for export market for Tony. All right. Nice. So same thing, same thing with, with Phil. While Phil is already, you know, talking to international players by the virtue of Phil being onboarded on our marketplace as a face array multi-beam antenna provider, our customers globally will now have access to Phil's unique ground station capability that um, that we would bring to them. Well, that's a good segue for you, Phil. Uh, and I've got your How It Works page up on your uh, Quasar website. Yeah, talk us into the Quasar solution uh, using a multiple antenna beams in on its phased array. Talk us into the tech. All right. Okay. Yeah. So most uh, satellites uh, communicate with a single dish at the moment. They can only talk to one at a time. Yep. So our antenna, as Shankar mentioned, is a multi-beam antenna. So it's a software-defined antenna. And we can synthesize up to 100 beams on that antenna. And what that means is we can talk to 100 satellites simultaneously on quite a small dish. And that really changes the scalability and the cost and the friction points for space. 
So it's it's, uh, it's an open solution, software defined, as we mentioned earlier. So it really opens it up. As I say, at the moment, no one has managed to do this for Grand Station. It's a bit of a holy grail. Yep. And it's, it'll help with, uh, you know, the growth in, in space. There's 5,000 satellites in space today, over 50,000 by the end of this decade. So huge growth and grand infrastructure struggling to keep up already. So that's where we play. And you're going to be building a ground station out in remote New South Wales or country New South Wales. How, what's the process uh, that you're finding to, to do that? Mm. Well, we're working with the partners for this. So luckily, we've we got some very capable partners and we're working with Vocus, who's also um, involved in our shareholding. And they are producing the site for us and providing power and uh, internet access. And we are actually deploying a system there. So our first one's in New South Wales, but we'll be deploying around the world as well. So we expect okay. to have around 15 to 20 sites. The first in New South Wales for a range of reasons. And uh, we're Sydney based, but also obviously when we get that working middle of next year, then we'll expand from there very quickly. So. Well, look, I'm impressed with you both. You're seeing this is a, and space is a global industry, right? So you're seeing yourselves as global players. Uh, Phil, just a little bit on the ground station and the and the property. How, how does it setting yourselves up? I'm thinking of like the McDonald's uh, business model here. You're going to own the land and the like. How are you getting the partnerships and, mm. uh, and actually creating the opportunities for yourself in this, as a, particularly as a startup? Yeah. Well, it's very interesting for us. So we see ourselves having multiple markets. Um, so we're a direct player, but we're also a reseller. And we talked earlier about you know, some of the reseller sites. So what we want to do is we will own and operate the equipment. So we'll build these sites. We'll probably rent the space. We may not own the space. We'll put this yeah. in common areas where it's needed. But again, we won't be selling our technology. We'll sell access to it. So it's ground station as a service, yep. which is similar to, we talked about Microsoft All We talked about Amazon ground station. So we'll be part of that ecosystem. Uh, and again, we'll place our sites where it makes sense. So most of these are shared sites. Yep. And that suddenly gives us access to both wholesale and retail markets. As we talked about with Antares, Antares is a good mix for us because they're a software defined software, you know, satellite platform, if you like, from where to go, we'll provide the grad segment for that. So we sort of mix into the ecosystem, but we do it in a lot more cost effective way. What's the general footprint of a, of a ground station for you? Uh, very small. So a couple of hundred metres maximum, really quite a small area. Um, yeah. So only one antenna, which is smaller than a lot of the other parabolic dishes. So not a yeah, not a football sized field. Um, it's really quite small. And just yeah. to clarify, you're looking at around 15 within your sort of ground station cluster. What, what do you call a group of ground stations? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what the collective noun for a group of ground stations is. Gaggle or maybe a mess of ground stations. Um, mess, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we only have one antenna, so it doesn't make, you know, we don't have a whole lot of them. But at the moment, to get scale, you see some of the large operators out there have fields of antennas, you know, up to a dozen yeah. or more antennas to satellite, serves their satellites. Uh, we only need one for that. So, yeah, and all quickly. And Shankar, in terms of Phil and Quasar, how does that work? How many partners do you intend to have? I think you've got about 14 now. So again, do you, do you get to a, a point where you've got enough uh, and I take it you're operational now, right? Or you've got a 30th September trial on? Maybe tell us about that. Yeah, no, good question. So, uh, you know, we want to have a high TRL on our software. Um, so before people start trusting and using our software. So, so towards that end, we we have a demonstrator flight uh, in September uh, on PSLV on the ISRO rocket. And uh, some of the some of the mission uh, participants in that flight are also going to be marketplace participants eventually because just as we get a high TRL through the flight, we will also they will also get high TRL through that flight and you know so they become a serious player in space a lot of them are terrestrial players but now with this demonstrator flight they'll get to um, uh, to play in the space sector now the question is what is the right number of part, part, uh, marketplace participants is as many as much as as possible this is <laughs> an a marketplace right? exactly yeah. right it's all about choice it's about flexibility for our customers so anyone coming on to antares sas platform for their mission they must have ample choice they must have flexibility they must have control so it's all about not just cost but it's also availability the the, res the the response that they get and the experience that they get from different providers so we we would onboard as many uh, as past participants as uh, as those who want to and that could be right from a widget to a service provider 
and everybody in between. So that that gives that the choice that our customers need. Now, if I get this right, uh, Quasar, you operating in the S band. Uh, Shankar, are you looking at different bands in, of of communications, like even potentially K band and the like? Absolutely. So if you look at who our customers are going to be, everybody from a SATCOM operator to Earth Observation um, operator to to PNT operator. So, you know, climate change uh, uh, use cases. So we really are expecting and talking to a number of mission owners, um, you know, some maybe just universities and on the other spectrum, defense and intelligence. Right. So the whole whole spectrum of, um, you know, uh, uh, space users. Uh, or satellite operators and mission owners. And um, it, it, therefore, if it's Earth observation, you are more than content to be on S and X band. But if you are going into uh, SATCOMs, then you are looking at KA, KU, LC, and so forth. If you are a SAR operator within the Earth observation, you are looking at X band, L band, and so on and so forth. So, so it's courses for courses. And from our perspective, it's software-defined satellite with the software-defined radio on the spacecraft that you can uh, work with. And so long as a ground station provider like Phil, who provides multi-beam, multi-waveform, phased array capability, that's sweet. That's sweet for our customers because they can operate in any waveforms they want. Nice. Maybe a little bit more on the Aurora Space Cluster. Um, you both startups, you're sort of around less, well, both less than two years old. Would you exist without uh, that? assistance from SmartSat CRC. What, how have you found the sort of startup in the space, the Australian space industry and that journey? And Phil, maybe to you, yeah, and your ex-RAF and the like, I've looked at your, your background. Yeah, what's your, your makeup and where have you sort of started this company from? Is it due to the space cluster? Uh, actually, we joined the cluster after we started. So yeah, um, okay. yeah so we started the company first last year we wanted to join early, but we're very busy, you know, focused on getting the company up and running. And uh, we've joined them relatively recently, and it's been a, a great, you know, a great partnership for us. So it really opens up the ecosystem. One thing about the space in Australia is it's it's still small, and and you know, it's growing very fast. It's an ascent, but we have to work together because we've got lots of isolated companies working on different things, and things like the Aurora Cluster help that a lot. It really does make a lot. That interaction is very helpful. So we got in there as soon as we could. Um, but yeah, we had the company started, and we're already building antennas. Uh, we talked about bands earlier, so we're working on S, um, but we're always already started on X and we're working on KA as well. Nice. So those antennas are coming after our S band. So we'll cover the same bands that Shanka talked about. Yeah. And again, the initiation to start Quasar, did, where, where was the business opportunity? Did you see, yeah, what was your, your thinking in terms of the company and the founders? Mm. What, what triggered you to start this? It's a, it's a bit of a long journey, actually. Um, so CSIRO, of course, developed the technology for radio astronomy, and they're very advanced in that. They build most of the world's radio astronomy equipment. And I came from a telco background, and so when uh, they approached me to say, we really want to spin this company off, we'd like to get it to talk to satellites, and you have the right background, would you run this? And uh, when I looked at the technology and where the market was, it was an absolute opportunity to grab. So. CSIR already knew they wanted to commercialize it for satellites, but I had the commercial side of that. So that's how yeah. that happens. So yeah. it's an ex CSIRO spin out, right? Okay. Correct. Well, that makes it, it wasn't in my briefing. I should have done some bit more oh, so on that one. But that's yeah, what that was about. We are yeah. separate, but yeah, CSIRO passes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's kind of where I was going. It was like, who just starts a ground station, <laughs> ground based station company? So I'm glad it's come out of uh, something uh, like that with some of their research. And mm -hmm. maybe the same question to you, Shankar, is Antares, uh, what's what's initiated the, the startup uh, for you? Great question. Um, just seeing how much inefficiency and reinvention, right? So, so like I mentioned, uh, we, the, the three founders, um, we've met at Planet. But subsequently, I also had the privilege of working uh, uh, in, an, in, a, in an associate capacity uh, with uh, the likes of Satlogic and very briefly also Spire. So I was yeah. very inspired by all these new space companies and how they how they go about doing things vis-a-vis -vis the the kind of uh, the old space companies, the the behemoths, and and uh, we yet felt, despite the kind of new space. There is, a, there is a way to move forward in how you do things uh, in space uh, from the lessons of terrestrial experience. So we, the three of us are fundamentally technologists. 
we didn't come from it in, in, uh, with space backgrounds. Like typically what tends to happen for those in the space sector, they've been in space for many decades. Um, relatively for me, I'm only seven years in space. And prior to that, for 15 plus years, I was in Hewlett Packard and OpenTex doing various things. Uh, so was some of my other co-founders. They've been in Microsoft and Red Hat and and so forth. So so we, we looked at um, the current uh, uh, ecosystem and how satellites are done. And it said there has to be a better way. Uh, there has to be as a service model. Um, we, we take as a service granted uh, every, in everything else we do, but in satellite that didn't exist. So, you know, ground station as a service, also relatively new concept with AWS and Azure Orbital bringing that to forefront. And so we said, we have to make satellites easy. And how do you make satellite easy? By providing that capability as a service. And that's how we we envisioned um, the, the, the product. And we did a kind of very quick product market fit assessment by talking to space agencies, startups, uh, defense, um, uh, integrators, and everybody said, yep. And uh, while, while as we got the thumbs up and also the evidence of that, you know, it's great to get thumbs up, but we got to see the money. When, the, when we did our seed round, when the money started coming in and we were in a fortunate place to be oversubscribed, it was good. It was a good uh, validation that, yeah, there's probably something here. Now, you're going to, you're a SaaS platform. Do you think you'll be on the infrastructure? And I'm even hearing things like machine as a service as well within space where you can start to access satellites and have them for a period of time. Is that where you, you see, or is it just simply going to be on the, the data side? What type of, how far do you think you'll take this? Yeah, so right now we are a software, a software for satellites. So, yep. so for you to actually design a, a software digitally. So the whole process, the workflow starts from digital engineering of your satellite. So you build your satellite on the SaaS platform. It's a low code uh, platform. You build your satellite as in you design, you build again from the by using the marketplace participants you know products and services so you design you build you obviously test integrate and then you operate right so you fly so all that is off the SaaS platform and uh, and once you are flying then you we have this closed loop between the satellite digital satellite you put together on the terrestrial cloud with the physical satellite flying in space we have a closed loop. Think of it like a CI/CD pipeline between the terrestrial cloud and the space cloud, digitally mm -hmm. twinned. So your digital satellite you started with, it is now digitally twinned with the satellite in space with the real-time data feedback. So you're always maintaining the satellite in tandem. So that's great, right? Because now you're talking operational efficiency, resilience, risk management, and, and lots and lots of things with on-orbit software updates and so forth. Now, this is no different to what we already do terrestrially. You build something in the cloud, you deploy to the edge, and then you have this cloud to edge constant refresh and monitoring. Again, like I said, coming from that kind of a background, we just flipped it and said, why don't we do that between terrestrial cloud and that far edge terrestrially? Let's assume this, the spacecraft is that far edge. Let's create that feedback loop. That's what we ended up doing. And I'll tell you, you could do that and then start to sell the data that you've created uh, using that satellite, right? So you can potentially resell that data onto the marketplace. Is that the concept there as well? One of the questions I had was, who, who are you finding in the customers rather than just researchers? But have you got, it's one of those things with spaces, we have to you know, create businesses for lower earth orbit observation. Is that kind of the key point of the marketplace there for lower earth orbit? observation as well correct so the marketplace is for small sats um so yep. all the way up to 500 kilograms so you could put a one one new cube set or or a 250 300 kilogram like you know one web size bus satellite so you could design build operate a satellite for multiple missions it doesn't have to be a single payload you could have multiple payloads flying on the same satellite just like we are doing for our demonstrator for our demonstrator chris we got five massful payloads and at least two, and they're going to be more massless payloads. Mm -hmm. So we are also going to be flying massless payloads, i.e. Uh, software and models running on our payload computer or our edge processor without any physical form factor. Uh, the massful ones are the ones need to get 
integrated pre-flight, massless can happen after the flight. And we will continue to have more and more massless. And to your point there, that means lots of data is getting generated. Now, we are not in the business of operating a satellite, except for our own demonstrator satellite. Yeah. But when we deliver this capability, it is our customers who are flying their missions. To your question, what would they do with that data they are collecting? That's solving their mission. Um, that's probably why they are flying the mission for to 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 to, to solve a problem. But just like Amazon, I host merchants on Amazon.com. I get intelligence about that data that comes through the Amazon.com. Similarly, through our platform, we will get those intelligence of how satellites are being used and so forth within that segment of ensuring that's an obfuscation, there's privacy and so forth. So it's not knowing my mission customer one is doing this, my mission customer N is doing this, but it is really an abstracted data that can inform how best to continually improve the SaaS platform, if that makes sense, it, right? It, yeah, it does. Go, yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah, so 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 that's the other point. The, the last point I wanted to make was, this is not just to look down. The satellites we want people to design, build, operate, manage is not necessarily just look down on Earth, but also look up. So sp space domain awareness, space situational awareness yeah. are also use cases for people to uh, uh, design, build, and operate their satellites using our platform. And the last thing is I talked about this marketplace with bill of materials and service providers and so forth, but it will also include payload providers. You might BYO your payload, bring your own payload, but you could also pick a payload listed on the marketplace, which is qualified with the entire SaaS platform, and you fly and own that mission yourself. So again, removing the friction of running around looking for a payload, unless you build your own payload through research. But if you wanted a hyperspectral camera, it will be available in the marketplace. I think that the two key points, well, one last question, I suppose, is, but it's a key point for the both of you, is um, the, the scale and the speed to market. Are you finding uh, that the industry is open to both of you and how easy it is to scale? Uh, Phil, in terms of getting out in, across these partnerships, are you finding that there's inhibitors there for you, regulation or the like, or are you finding that you're able to scale to the speed that you want? Mm. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, in fact, we're finding very little barriers to market. So, you know, our business model is all about accessibility to space. And, you know, Shankar talked about you know, really, you know, space is becoming a, an extension to Earth Internet. We're going to be, you know, movable loads, software defined, generic. And our, our purpose is to move away from the legacy and the, and the you know, proprietary systems that are out there. So we have had enormous interest from overseas and we are doing trials and quite a lot of satellites when we launch, you know, including from four different continents at the moment. So we see a huge interest in what we're doing because it's a different kind of technology. And at the end of the day, all our satellites still have to have a way to call home. And so that's where we play in. Yeah. yeah. And Shankhead, maybe to finish off there, your scale you, global business, and you, that's the trouble with the marketplace. You've got to build it as fast as you possibly can, right? So, uh, yeah, how are you finding your scale? Yeah, no, great question. So before I answer, I want to also touch on the other question you asked about the data. And I'll, I'll yeah. answer that and come to the scalable scale, uh, scaling question, Chris. So, you know, one of the things that's going to happen with this sort of software-defined satellite and, and, and the ability for it to generate lots of data Usually what happens is you've got to bring the data down and you do all of the processing. Because it's software defined with the capability of edge processing that we have in our architecture, including in our demonstrator, we have the ability, to, we're going to demonstrate ourselves in a demonstrator flight, but also our future customers to turn the satellite into an autonomous vehicle. So, so they're going to be able to use the data that's being generated either through the payload or from the satellite uh, sensors pump that into the edge device, not just for pre-processing, but also post-processing. So typically what happens is you'll have to bring the data down, you run the uh, models on the ground, then you upload. The, you know, the, the, the processing capability on the satellite, the power in the satellite is increasing exponentially. As the satellites are getting smaller, the power form factor is also getting larger because of the technological improvements. So what we are going to be able to do is to use the data and turn those satellites into autonomous vehicle. And that has significant impact. And as you can imagine, everything from, 
you know, not just uh, debris avoidance, but also making sure from an ISR, from, you know, bad actors point of view, how you behave, right? How, how your satellite is going to be kept safe out there in the future warfare. So think about all that uh, uh, possibilities with that thinking satellite, if I can call it, um, that you will create. Yeah. Correct. It's all that edge device computing, really, before you bring that data back. Uh, and there's something you mentioned AI craft in that as well. And that's what they're on as well. well look, um, you two are definitely ones to watch, I think, particularly on signing this new partnership uh, for Antares as well. And Phil, uh, the likes of Antares gives you an immediate market uh, place, you know, to, to show your wares as well. So best of luck to both of you. Definitely a story to follow. So we've been joined by Phil Ridley, CEO with Quasar Satellite Technologies and Shankar Sivaprakasam co-founder with Antares. Gents, thanks so much for joining us today on Australia in Space TV. Thank you, Chris. Pleasure, Chris. Well done.